So if you've been following along with us, you'll know that there are two primary sets of English North American colonies um, by 1630. You have, um, you have Virginia and Maryland, what were collectively known as the tobacco colonies. And approximately 500 miles to the north, you've got what we refer to as the New England colonies. I'm hopeful at this point that you understand it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, New England was very different than the tobacco colonies socially, economically, and even to some extent politically as well. Now, we're going to talk about today the further diversification of the New England colonies, and we're also going to talk about the broadening of the scope of the English North American Empire as the uh, uh, period unfolds. If you recall, I, I had, I'd explained that one of the things that really set New England apart from Virginia was the concept of Yemen farming. Keep in mind, Yemen farmers were not producing for urban markets, in places like London or Paris, and that's who Virginia was producing for. So in Virginia, what you've got are big, large plantations, and really what you've got in New England are smaller farms. It's really farm in the, the very traditional sense. And as you're going to find out, New Englanders are going to perfect Yemen society almost to a fault. You'll see what I mean here in just a second. But as New England begins to grow up, what they begin to establish are, 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 are what they call towns. Okay, Now, what the towns were, what you probably are thinking that they were, there were small municipalities. But the central organizing factor within in the town uh, were your congregational churches. It was the church that occupied such an important role in Puritan life. And really, when I say towns, I, I mean the jurisdictional uh, authority of, of whatever church, Puritan church, that you're talking about. Uh, so in Dedham, Massachusetts, for example, the central feature within that town would have been their church. Um, we know that part of the philosophy of building the Church of England outside of England was really, really progressive in the sense that, um, you know, land was handed out on a much more equal footing than it was in a place like Virginia. But if you think about the northeastern part of the United States, think Massachusetts, it's not a huge state, right? And so anyway, one of the things that the Puritans perfected was their mission in life, and if you were a Puritan man, you really had two things that you were responsible for. One was to populate the area, have Puritan children, and the other was to provide your male children with land so that they could become Puritan farmers as well, and the whole thing would start all over again. Well, if you're connecting the dots, you can understand pretty quickly that you're going to run out of land uh, through overpopulation. And so this puts Puritan society in New England in a relative, relatively difficult position. One of the things that they do to, to address this issue is they, they, they go into the wilderness. They go west, they go north into um, what would become Maine. And Maine's right, really a part of Massachusetts and would be right through the early part of the 19th century. They also um, go, go west into what would become New Hampshire and Vermont, and they literally hack out new settlements from the wilderness. They carve them out of the forest, and the, the term just stuck, and they referred to these new settlements as the forest colonies because they had carved them out of the wilderness. Now, one of those forest colonies is the future state of Vermont. But the interesting thing about Vermont, and this is kind of similar to Texas as well, in the aftermath of the American Revolution, it won't enter into the United States automatically. As a matter of fact, it's going to enter several years after the Revolutionary War is won. And between the years 1777 to 1791, Vermont is going to be an independent republic, similar to how Texas was an independent republic and it will enter into the United States in the aftermath of 1791. Now, another really important feature in New England is the diversification of their economy. Now, I want you to understand that their economy is diversifying primarily out of necessity because plantation labor, plantation life, generally speaking, can be exploited much, much more effectively in the South where you have 
accessed much, much more land. So New Englanders had to think very critically about the way that they were organizing their economy. One of the things that they're going to begin doing is developing what, what we might call a business sector, a production center that might be a little bit better. Um, what this has become referred to over the course of time is the household mode of production. They're producers to be sure, they, they, are, they are butchers, uh, they are shoemakers, they are metal workers, they are textile weavers, but they're doing it not on a mass production level. This is being done at the home level. And part of the reason why it's being done is land is becoming increasingly scarce. So people are going to have to think much more abstractly about how they're going to make a living in the world and the household mode of production in addition to um, uh, allowing for more economic opportunity is a response to running out of the land. Now, as its economy begins to diversify, one of the other things that you begin to see is the springing up of urban centers, cities. I mean, simply put, what cities were were centers of trade. And if you think about some of the cities that really define that part of the country, Boston, Newport, Salem, um, everything from fish to slaves were traded and exchanged in, in these provincial capitals. They also become centers of production. Um, it's not going to be a coincidence that Boston in, in particular is going to become very well known for its shipyards, making ships, um, its iron foundries, uh, ropes were made in Boston, sails were made in Boston. It's a place where things are produced in addition to where things are traded and sold. Now, with all of this being the case, with the, the, with the rise of production, you're going to also see the rise of crafts. Um, crafts and skilled craftsmen. This is, this is not what you might think it is in the sense that it's not simply a worker. This is an individual that has spent years of his life, and I do emphasize the word his, his life learning a craft, learning how to become, for instance, a shoemaker. Um, this, was, this was something that you essentially paid for in the sense that when you were an apprentice, uh, you were bound to one of these master craftsmen so that you could learn the, the trade and one day you yourself, at least the hope was, could become one of these master craftsmen. And so what you're beginning to see is, is diversification coming to New England pretty early on. And one way that it's diversifying is the establishment of, 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 of a class system. I mean, maybe not real formally, but you, you are beginning to see people being bound to other people in the form of labor. A um, couple examples that we can point to to that end. Paul Revere. Um, Paul Revere, by trade, is a pewter smith. Um, you'll see why that's important a little bit later as we approach the American Revolution. Uh, Benjamin Franklin is a printer. Uh, the printing press was the cutting edge technology of the era, and uh, you had to spend years of your life learning how to go ahead and become one of these skilled uh, workers. But the individual that I want to focus on for a minute or two is the guy that you're looking at on the screen there, and that's George Robert Twelves Hughes, who by trade is a shoemaker. Um, he's a skilled shoemaker, and he wants to uh, repair the shoe of the richest man, the, the most richest man in Boston, and that would be um, that, that that would be John Hancock. Now, the reason that I tell you this story is because Hancock was the richest man. He was an importer and an exporter, and Hughes was a shoemaker that was becoming increasingly desperate for virtually any kind of business that he could get his hands on. And so what you're really beginning to see is the development of poverty in some of these, um, in some, some of these laboring classes. And, and Hughes would be one of these individuals. And he's also going to be one of these individuals that are going to be critical of the system, of the economic system that will grow up in some of these urban centers, Boston probably most importantly. But for right now, I want to turn our attention on the Puritan Church just for a moment. Keep in mind, it was the central most figure within Puritan life in New England. 
And that meant for a lot of reasons it called the shots. And over the course of time, what you're going to see is the loosening of the grip of the Puritan church. And one place that we can see this very, very directly is through the institution of education. Now, if you know anything about schools like Oxford, Cambridge, Paris, you'll know that they are not only very, very old universities, they're also very prestigious universities, very, very well-renowned um, universities. And in the 1630s, if you wanted to have your kid educated in any kind of elite institution, you had to send them back to England. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people making money over here in the New World, but there really isn't any kind of elite academic institution until 1636. It's in that year that the good people in Massachusetts are going to establish what they at first call Harvard College. Harvard, much like Oxford before it, got its start more or less as a cathedral school, as a seminary school. This was an institution where you would send your, 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 your kid uh, more times than not, uh, a man, uh, to be educated in the world of uh, biblical studies, in the world of scripture. However, what's going to happen to Harvard is the adoption of, 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 of a more diverse uh, curriculum. And this is going to take decades, really multiple decades, for it to kind of come full circle. But what's happening at Harvard will eventually happening, excuse me, happen in other parts of the academic world, in the new world as well. They get a guy by the name of President John Levert in there, and in 1782, what he does is he establishes a medical school. Now, this is approximately 100 years in the aftermath of Harvard being established, but medicine begins to be integrated into the curricula. Several years later, uh, they establish a law school, and by 1906, there's a business school. The good people, um, not so far away in, in, in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, felt that this was not what Harvard should be doing, and it's certainly not why Harvard was established in the first place. It was, it was, a, it was a place to study the Bible. And so in 17, 1701, uh, the, the, there are another group of um, academics that will establish what they call collegiate school. And what they're really focused on from 1701 to 1721 would be Puritan orthodoxy, right? Again, it's a center for religious study. And in the aftermath of 1721, what you begin seeing happening at Yale University, collegiate college, excuse me, collegiate school eventually would become what you call Yale University, is a process of secularization. To keep up with the Harvards of the world, they establish a law school and a medical school and eventually a business school, and they diversify the curriculum. But in any case, what I need you to understand is we now have at least two, eventually we'll add three, elite academic institutions that are now firmly on the North American continent. And so now all of a sudden you don't have to send uh, your son across the Atlantic Ocean to have him educated. In the process, what this is going to do is it's going to loosen the grip that the Puritan Church had on colonial America. Right now, what I'd like to do is turn our attention to the region in between New England and Virginia. And keep in mind, I told you there's this 500-mile gap between the two colonial societies. And what historians generally refer to this gap as is what would come to be known as the Middle Atlantic Colonies, or maybe just more succinctly, the Middle Colonies. The Middle Colonies, um, at one point in time, belonged to the Dutch. If you think back to that lecture, the European colonial expansion, you'll know that the Dutch interests within North America were, were, were the future states of New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. Those are what I want you to refer to as the Middle Colonies for your notes. Because they were settled by the Dutch, uh, because the Dutch encouraged immigration from, from very diverse parts of Europe, the Middle Atlantic colonies had always been home to a lot of social, uh, ethnic, national, and religious diversity. As a matter of fact, the, the, the central city within the Middle Atlantic colonies, um, New Amsterdam, what would eventually be renamed New York City, 
On any given day, New York City is the most diverse city anywhere in the uh, English North American colonies. Now, before they can become the middle colonies, they had to be taken by the English. Um, they're going to do this in 1664, and they're going to take the middle colonies from the Dutch, and they're going to do so without the use of force. Um, what the English are really going to do is they're, they're, they're going to ask the Dutch, um, we're going to give you a choice. We can either go to war and we'll, 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 we'll blow you to kingdom come, um, or you can switch your alliance. And, and honestly, why would you not? I mean, you're in the business of making money, and uh, we're still more than happy to allow you to make money. We just need you to switch teams, so to speak. And so this is how the English uh, come to ultimately annex the Dutch interest in North America and how the middle colonies became part of the English North American Empire in 1664. Now, there's one more thing that I want to talk about before we end our conversation on these Atlantic colonies. And that would be that that once again goes back to this idea of the development of American political thought. One of the individuals to that end that I'd like you to be mindful of would be a German immigrant by the name of John Peter Zinger. And similar to Benjamin Franklin, by trade, this guy is going to become a printer, printer press operator. And it's around about this time that he gets himself into some trouble with the city government in New York. He had started this newspaper that he called the Weekly Journal. And in it, he, he wrote about the city government in New York City. And he accused its leadership of being corrupt, accused it of being incompetent, and accused the leaders of, of being very poor quality leaders. And they sued him for seditious libel. You can't say that about us. And so the case goes to court. Um, as it turns out, John Peter Zinger was, was able to prove that in fact, charges that he levied through his newspaper were actually true. Um, these city officials were corrupt, uh, they, they were incompetent, and, and it wasn't libel. What he was actually printing was the truth. Now, over the course of American history, you and I are going to call this uh, freedom of the press, and the news media is going to be a very important part of our democracy throughout the course of American history. It's not a coincidence whatsoever that Benjamin Franklin, another good newsman in American history, um, insisted that the uh, freedom of the press, a free and independent press, not controlled, not subservient to the state, independent of the state, be not in the second, third, or fourth amendment, but be right there in the first amendment. It was that important of a freedom as far as Franklin was concerned. And we really begin to see the concept of freedom of the press become established under the Zinger case. Um, in what would become upstate New York, uh, downstate New Jersey, the more rural parts of those colonies, um, you, you'll see what comes to be known as the breadbasket of North America. Um, that being said, they didn't think of themselves as the breadbasket. Uh, this was considered poor man's country, primarily because it was really difficult to make a living in that part of the country. This is the ideal climate for growing wheat, corn, and other food crops. And it's important that you understand that for a number of different reasons. Farming is going to be a very important part of life in the North. But unlike the South, the crops that are going to be emphasized, crops like wheat, are going to be very different than, than, than tobacco and a lot, lot different than, than the food stuff, or excuse me, the, the cash crop that is going to become known as cotton. Um, each of these colonies, I think, I think it's important to understand, each of these colonies imported thousands and thousands of slaves from, the, uh, from Africa as well as the Caribbean. I think a lot of times um, we, we forget that once upon a time New York was a, a thriving slave. Uh, slave society, and, and certainly that would have been the case for the breadbasket of North America as well. Um, I want to spend just a minute on New Jersey, if we might. Um, what you've got in New Jersey is an awful lot of religious diversity. You've got people coming from really all across North and Western Europe. Uh, you've got immigrants from Scotland, and they're bringing with them 
uh, the Presbyterian Church, or what would become known as the Presbyterian Church. Of course, the Dutch always had a heavy presence in the area, and they're bringing the Dutch Reformed Church along with them. Lots of Germans, which means that you're getting a lot of Lutherans and a lot of Calvinists. From France, you're getting a lot of Huguenots, uh, later the French Reformed Church, and you're getting Quakers from all across the northern European sector of the continent. And these people are, are very diverse in their religious orientations, and it's going to produce a very diverse society in what would become known as New Jersey. I'd like to end our conversation with a couple quick examples. One would be a Presbyterian minister by the name of William Tennant, who is going to arrive and become very dissatisfied with the American version of the Presbyterian church. He's a, uh, a Scots-Irish immigrant. He's going to be so dissatisfied that eventually he's going to come to found this uh, religious learning center that, that he referred to as Log College, um, because at the time it was literally a, a log cabin that was a center for studying religion, and they just called it Log Cabin College. The purpose of this was to reform Presbyterianism, so it was more suitable to his liking. Much like Harvard, much like Yale, eventually this is going to evolve into the College of New Jersey, and eventually to what we call uh, Princeton University, another very elite university, but also one that's very old in the American context. John Woolman is another religious man in the New Jersey region that we need to be mindful of, um, except unlike Tennant, who, whose main contributions would probably fit squarely in the context of education, Woolman is going to bring some very critical thoughts to the institution of slavery, which was practiced widely throughout New Jersey, similar to how it was in New York. He's a Quaker, and over the course of American history, what you're going to see are, are, are the Quakers become some of the more outspoken critics of the institution of slavery. And, and much of this, not all, but much of it does begin with John Woolman, who writes this really important book uh, entitled Some Considerations on the Keeping of Negroes. Um, this is a very critical book when it comes to slavery. And it really poses the question, is slavery, as it's being practiced here in the Americas, is this consistent with the teachings of, uh, of, of Christian churches? And in the end, he comes to the conclusion that it simply isn't. But he doesn't just sit on that conclusion. Woolman, the guy that you're looking at at the bottom of the screen there, uh, traveled extensively throughout the region of, of the middle, middle colonies. And what he does is he begins encouraging slave owners to free their slaves. And in the process, he becomes a very early voice for what would become known as the abolition movement, the anti-slavery cause. And so what you're getting here, guys, is not only the expansion of the English presence in North America, you've got a very diverse collection of people that are all living in the region, all doing business within the region, and they're all beginning to influence each other throughout the course of time um, leading up to the American Revolution. This is going to have a very profound impact on how colonization was experienced and ultimately how these future states would evolve over the next several decades. Now, we'll pick it up there the next time we